So you're a founder of the, the studio. Yep. You were also a part of uh, another studio called Black Isle Entertainment. Black Isle Studios. Black Isle yep. Studios, sorry. And that was oh, shit. just a few people coming together, decided you wanted to make games, and like, how did how did that all happen? How did you... So, so Black Isle Studios, um, every, like, there are a bunch of people that work here that did work at that studio, and that studio was part of Interplay Productions. And so when I came into the industry in 94, Five, as a QA tester. Um, I wound up working with a lot of people. I worked in the sports division for a while as the producer. Uh, but after a while, my, my real passion was in things like D&D and role-playing games. So like that's what I, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And Fergus Urquhart, who is the, the CEO of our company now, of Obsidian, uh, he had just recently become the division head of, uh, of what would become Black Isle Studios. At the time, it was called um, dragon play, play, but anyhow, so we we not long after that, not long after the release of Fallout, actually, which was the first game that that division officially did, uh, we changed the name to Black Isle Studios. And so, like I said, I had wanted to work on role playing games. I had been playing D and D since like fifth, sixth grade. Um, I loved playing role playing games like Bard's Tale, um, Wasteland, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I talked to Fergus who I'd worked with in QA and managed to get transferred over there and um, got incredibly, incredibly lucky. Um, uh, I, I, got, I got two um, kind of okay games that I really just needed to finish. One was called Red Asphalt, one was called uh, Dragon Dice, uh, neither of which were amazing. But what was amazing was I got uh, what was called FRRPG at the time, which was with this little, tiny Canadian company you might have heard of called Bioware. Oh. And that game became Baldur's Gate. And I uh, worked incredibly close with, uh, with Bioware. And uh, that was an incredibly difficult year and a half. But at the end of it, we, uh, we managed to ship Baldur's Gate, which was amazing. Um, and then additionally, people, other people you know, at, at Black Isle Studios were working on different things, right? So we did the fallouts and uh, Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, I should say, just to be clear. Obviously, Bethesda did Fallout 3 many years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, um, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, which was one of our first console titles. Uh, we did Icewind Dale 2. Uh, we did several expansions for the Icewind Dales. Uh, I think I'm hitting all that stuff. At any rate, a bunch of us had all worked together, including uh, me, obviously, Fergus Hurricart, who was the division head, and then Darren Monahan who was the producer with me on Icewind Dale, but then also went on into Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. And so like around 2001, I had started talking with Fergus about how like we could do everything that Interplay was doing, you know, in terms of developing games. Like mm -hmm. we, should, we should go be, this is bad news. I'm talking instead of playing. It's okay. <laughs> um, the, um, your character is amazing though. I could be totally, like lazy about how I'm playing and still kill everything, because <laughs> um, my character would be so dead right now. Uh, we talked. It's, talk, it's we, the toe greaves. That's what really ties it all together. Uh, you know what? I like them. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see that on the stream, but these are the most amazing metal like ninja shoes I've ever seen. <laughs> um, uh, nothing really came of that though. And then in 2002, Fergus and Darren and I started talking about it. I think, you know, there was maybe a little bit more of an idea there, but we still weren't ready to really break off and do anything. And then in 2003, um, Interplay lost the TSR license, and one of the games that I was working on at the time, in fact, Josh Sawyer was working on it with me, was um, you know, gonna be our sort of 3D version of Baldur's Gate, so to speak. And, um, and obviously, we weren't gonna make that anymore if we didn't have a D&D license. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of it, like, um, you know, we, Fer Fergus and Darren and I uh, all sort of quit. Uh, all sort of quit means actually quit. And then uh, we talked to a few other people about joining the studio as, as owners as well. So that was uh, Chris Jones and Chris Avalone. And on June 12th of 2003, we, uh, we officially started the company. That was when we received our papers of incorporation from the state of California. And it was like right around then that we started like taking our money and putting it in the bank. 
so that we could then start up a payroll and pay ourselves mm -hmm. and, and lose money on that whole thing because we had to then pay payroll taxes on money we put into the bank. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but it let us like start up medical insurance and, uh, and do some stuff. And basically, you know, we just said like, um, let's try this for six months or so. And if, if this works out, fantastico. And if not, we'll just go our separate ways and, and, and take the accumulated debts that we've each, you know, racked up. Uh, if we don't have a contract, like if we don't have a paying gig. Mm -hmm. And so we did a bunch of stuff to try to, uh, to, to get projects. We had a number that were sort of uh, uh, close, to, close, to, um, close to getting signed, but ultimately the one we obviously first signed was Coder 2. Mm -hmm. And so, so, oh, go ahead. Okay, no. So uh, before we get to that, um, what was it like making that decision like to leave something that was established already and to say like, I mean, you're much younger than, I mean, it's a, it's a risk inherently, but to, to go out on your own to go just fully independent at that point. Yeah, um, that, that's a hard decision. Um, and you know, and I think even if you look back at 2001 and 2002, that was ultimately why we, we didn't pull the trigger on that. Um, but I think in 2003, it had sort of gotten to the point where we didn't think Interplay was actually going to be stable in the long term. Like, it didn't feel like it had the legs to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, and in 2004, 5, 6, you know, it did. It failed. Um, and then, um, so that was, a, that was an issue um, that helped, you know, helped motivate us. But at the same time, like, um, I guess, I guess all three of us were motivated. You know, it felt like the right time. And I just went to my wife uh, at the time and said like, you know, is, is this something I should do? Like, you know, do you think, you know, this is crazy? Like, you know, we could lose, you know, tons of money that we don't really have. Um, you know, most of the business was actually financed on credit cards. and. She just said, I think if there's three people that can pull this off, I think it's you guys. Okay. You know, and that's pretty much what, what Fergus's wife said too. And so we were just like, okay, let's go for it. Yeah, and um, support the family and. Yeah, I mean, the most important people in our lives said, yeah, like, you know, go do it. And, and if, you, if you do fail, like, well, I mean, at least you tried. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, worst thing you could do is exactly what you're worried about. Like the other side of the coin is, maybe you guys actually make this work and you and you do have your own company. And so, um, like you said, then it was, you know, who had space? Fergus had a finished attic. <laughs> and, yeah, this is, this is really and, uh, Yeah, and like, so I, I had the biggest car. I had a Ford Explorer at the time. So like, I drove to Costco and bought folding tables and and we, we got crummy office chairs and um, and those folding tables were our desks for a long time. And in fact, uh, you probably remember like CRTs back then, like they were like maybe like 21 inches was the screen size, but they were like, I don't know, they felt like they were three feet deep and they yeah. weighed 70 pounds. They have some mass to them. Yeah, go put one of those on a Costco table. And what oh. you find out is after a day or two, it just slowly Flip. starts sinking down into the plastic. <laughs> and so, um, so one day I went to Home Depot and had them uh, rip a, like a five by eight piece of plywood into these uh, six by one sheets. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to put these six by one sheets of plywood on top of our Costco desks to put the CRTs on top of those so that the monitors wouldn't <laughs> sink into the, into the desks. Um, yeah, it was class setup. It was really awesome. All while being in Ferguson's attic. Yeah, and this is all in Ferguson's attic, yeah. Uh, how did it feel to after leaving, becoming independent, and then have the opportunity to work oh. on a Star Wars game for your for the, yeah. the studio's first title. Yeah, that was that was pretty unbelievable, actually. So um, obviously, I'd worked with Bioware before, and uh, and I knew that they were going to deliver a really good game. But when we signed up to do that game, uh, Coder wasn't done yet. Oh, really? So we were signing up to do a sequel to a game that we had never actually seen outside of like press materials, and so <laughs> and then. And then at some point, um, of course, Bio was very busy because they were they were finishing it up. But at some point, they sent uh, two engineers to us 
to help us set up the development environment. And I always felt bad for these two engineers because they they show up and like we escort them to Fergus's attic where there's five <laughs> computers. And I'm like, you work at Bioware, which is now incredibly well established in the industry. You know, obviously professional, amazing RPG developer. And you're an engineer on uh, Knights of the Old Republic, which is clearly gonna be an amazing game. And you're taking all of your hard work and you're giving it to five dudes in an attic <laughs> and saying like, they're gonna go make the sequel to this. And so, um, <laughs> were they like, is this, I, is this the right house? I right, mean, exactly. That's what I, that's how I felt they felt yeah. the whole time uh, that they were there. They were just like, really? We're, we're doing this, huh? Okay, well, that's, that's fine. We'll just keep doing it. Um, anyhow, so it was pretty incredible. I do remember uh, when I was playing Coder for the first time, uh, the game that I'm going to be making the sequel to now, and getting to the, the big reveal, you know, on the middle of the game-ish there, and just being like, I am so screwed. Like, <laughs> we have such a tall order to fill here. Like, this is gonna be, this is gonna be rough. And, um, but it was okay. I mean, there's a couple of things. Coder was the coolest thing I had seen with Star Wars in a really long time, and mm -hmm. I was working on the sequel to that. I guess yeah. that's what I'm trying to say, right? So like, that was just, that was just like something that was amazing. Not just working on Star Wars, but working on a, on a property of the sequel to something that already I think I'd like killed it doing Star Wars, and so and so that was pretty amazing. Um, and um, I'm actually wearing my Skywalker Ranch hat today, which oh, nice. is coincidental. But um, yeah, I got to go up to Skywalker Ranch. Who can't think that that's the most amazing thing ever? How did the name Obsidian come about? Was there any other names on the table that you thought might? Be in the running, or <laughs> yeah. So um, told the story before. I'm not. I'm not super excited about it because I don't think it's like the the greatest note in our history. Okay. But so um, sometime after the three of us, me and Darren and Fergus, had quit, and possibly the other guys too. I just remember it was me and Darren and Fergus meeting. Uh, we met in my backyard one night, and we knew that we had to get this paperwork submitted for getting our business license. And, and so we were, we're basically giving ourselves dates. And so we were now on the last day and we, we needed to pick our freaking name. Right? Oh. And, we had, <laughs> and we had gone through uh, a fair number of different, uh, different names. Like we each come up with lists of, of all kinds of stuff. Some of which were like, you know, super tough, like uh, 12 gauge studios or, um, you know, I don't know. I remember Three Clowns Studio was like our goofy <laughs> one because there was three of us and okay, and and the idea. And by the way, Fergus's background is in production, and my background is in production, and Darren's background is in production. Like that's not exact. I mean, it's not 100 percent true because Darren came up as a as a, a programmer. Um, you know, I have done design work and artwork, even though my focus is always on production. Mm -hmm. You know, Fergus has done a little bit of everything. So like, we have the knowledge base for everything, but ultimately when you get down to the bottom, it's three producers, which are not the three people you want to go make a game. You want like <laughs> three developers. You want like two engineers and an artist at the least, yeah. right? That's what you want. Missing <laughs> some key pieces it's, perhaps. Right. And so, you know, Three Clowns was kind of a nod to that too. It's like, <laughs> like, look at us, like three producer types go to go start a studio. Um, Sounds so. like it's a great pitch for a movie. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, Maybe it was called Three Amigos. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so, uh, but of course we had serious names on there too. And one of them was Obsidian. And, and we all liked Obsidian, but like on the grand scheme, like it wasn't like ranking, you know, a 10 out of 10. It was ranking a solid, you know, seven or eight out of 10, but it wasn't objectionable to anybody. Everybody was like, yeah, it's okay. I don't love it, but it's not the worst. And, um, I mean, and, better than three clowns is that of course <laughs> like long term could you imagine if it was three clowns software? Yeah, like we, we probably would have never signed the first contract right like that would have just been it like LucasArts would have been like wait Bioware you want us to sign up three clowns for this no that's These not gonna happen guys, are you sure about yeah, this like, no that's not gonna happen um so oh man how many how many of you guys did I pull like all of you um 
So anyhow, so again, enter the wives. Uh, we said like, hey, out of like all of these studios, basically like, which one are you not embarrassed to have your husband associated with? And um, and the answer wound up being Obsidian, right? And and actually they were like, well, I mean, there's some, you know, there's obviously like good elements to that in terms of, you know, there's sort of a very loose association with Black Isle Studios mm -hmm. in that they, you know, sort of visually hearken to each other a little bit. And, um, you know, and Obsidian is the sharpest naturally occurring substance on the planet. Like, yeah. It's also light we're, too. We're sharp. Yeah. It's we're shiny. <laughs> um, you know, so there was like, there was like some stuff there. And so, so ultimately like we were just out of time and we were like, yep, yeah, you know what? Let's just go with Obsidian. Like, it's like, it's like a little safe, I guess is the thing. But, but we all thought it was pretty good. The studio worked on KOTOR 2, Neverwinter Nights, um, and then to uh, Alpha Protocol. Yes. Yes. What, because KOTOR and Neverwinter Nights were sequels, and obviously, specifically Neverwinter Nights is in the studio's wheelhouse, right, mm -hmm. with the isometric RPG, um, were there any unexpected challenges working on a, a new IP as your original title? kind of coming out of the gate? Yeah, so we tried to do a lot of new things with Alpha Protocol, um, and, and maybe too many new things, right? Like, maybe that's some of the reasons why we had so many struggles. Um, you know, and just to put that in context, like, that game was in development for three and a half or four years when games were typically about, you know, two or maybe three years at the outside back then. And so it was in there a long time because we had to do a reboot in the middle of it and rethink a bunch of stuff about it. And, you know, obviously it wasn't really our wheelhouse to do a, a third person shooter. And, and so we had struggles with that. In terms of, in terms of taking on the IP, that was, that was less challenging. The studio has such, or has such a strong, and had, had and has, such a strong group of, of narrative folks that, that coming up with the IP and how we wanted it to work and what the characters were gonna be and, even how the story was going to be told, even though the story was told in a way that was um, completely foreign to like a Neverwinter Nights 2, that stuff was all pretty easy. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the stuff that we really, really struggled with was um, making the game pretty enough um, when you're going to get, you know, so much closer to things than you did in a lot of other, our other games. And, and, um, and making all of that, that just moment to moment gameplay actually feel good. Like mm -hmm. I still think Alpha Protocol is like pretty janky when you play it. Like the controls like work, but they're not great. Like, you know, and that's just as good as we got them before we shipped it. And I think that was really our biggest challenge was just changing gears and, and going to something that was from a play style so much different than anything we had done before. You were on New Vegas, closing it down, and uh, interesting oh, stories. Oh, right. I just, I just came on at the very end. So, so I went around and I kind of asked the team, like, what can I help on? And there, everybody kind of knew, like, what they were doing. And so the first thing I did is I helped out a great guy named Charlie Staples, uh, whose job was to figure out how to get New Vegas to run in memory on the consoles. Because we had been a little bit too lazy. And... And uh, this is gonna be this is gonna be the end, my friends. Um, and and a lot of the areas just plain old. Oh, that's a roll. That's a roll. How do I? I can I can have to push the button without any any uh, any D pad. Yep, any like movement input. Oh yep. my gosh. Okay. Um, so so literally, I'm I'm the development director, and what I wind up doing on Fallout New Vegas is just sitting there playing Fallout New Vegas, loading levels and unloading levels, just doing like straight up grunt uh, data work for like a week and a half while we're just figuring out whether or not we can get these things to load in and out of levels. Mm -hmm. And that was like my first huge contribution to Fallout New Vegas was doing. Uh, something uh, I could have hired anybody to do, actually, because there was almost no no work to it at all. But oh, that's uh, we're still on ten minute no oh, horse. Oh, we're on ten minute no horse. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just no, thinking. Okay. I was thinking. I died. I'm free. But all <laughs> I can do is heal myself now. Yeah. Right? You can. You can yeah. heal and you can dodge roll. Okay. So you still that's lost fine. your item and you can't ride the horse. It's all good. Uh, 
So then uh, I figured out that nobody was doing any of the localizations, and we needed to localize for uh, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. Mm. And so I started poking my nose into that, and uh, it was going to be, I don't want to fight that guy. It was going to be like a complete mess to localize. And so ultimately what I did on Fallout New Vegas was handle all of those localizations. I came up with the entire process to localize them, wound up working with all the localization studios, which, which the actual translation of the words was handled by Bethesda, and they hired a studio that did okay. all that. But in terms of getting all the data out of the game, sending it off, getting it back, putting it in, and then repeating that iteration process until basically everything is done and then fixing all the bugs and whatever, like that's what I did for, I don't know, three, three and a half months, uh, my, my contribution to finishing up, finishing up that game. So one of the most boring things, but also one of the most necessary things. And so I guess um, for some people that don't know, what, uh, what is a publisher's purpose? Like, with the with an agreement with the development studio. You mean like how does that relationship yeah, work? Yeah, so like they obviously they help with like the marketing, advertising, the funding, I believe, and yep. then they have some say into the sure. things that go into the game. Yeah, so I think that the most important thing is the funding, right? Like that's that's really why developers entering into that um, into that partnership in the first place is to Ooh. nice dodge. Jesus, dude. Relax. Ooh. Um, you know, I, I, I think that is what most developers are looking for. Is uh, it would have been nice if I'd seen those. I guess, I guess, I guess the volume should have, or the the sound oh, effect should have clued me in. Way. You've been able to heal for quite some time. I, yeah, I know. Okay. I'm just busy blabbing rather than actually like really paying attention to what's going on in the game. Okay. Sam messaged about it though. He's like, you know, he's allowed to heal, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I think the biggest thing. Did I not get a roll in there? Come on. There you go. Um, I was like, was that? My chachink of death or his chachink of death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so mostly the funding, right? So, so like it's very hard to come up with, um, you know, even for Pillars of Eternity. So, um, we raised, you know, four million dollars on the Kickstarter. It probably cost us more like seven million dollars to make that game. Oh wow! Um, and so, you know, so games basically are are expensive. And so mm -hmm. somebody needs to do that. But when you put up the money and you take the financial risk, then you know, it's straight up capitalism, you get the greatest rewards. And so your typical publisher agreement would be something like, you know, we're gonna fund the game, you know, it's gonna cost whatever, let's say it was pillars, it's gonna cost seven million dollars. So the, f the first receipts that come back all go into our pocket until we've made that seven million dollars back. And then after that, we're going to keep, you know, 80% that would, that would be generous. We're going to keep 85% of the net revenue, and the developer will get 15% oh, wow. of the net revenue. And so that 15% is when you hear developers talking about their royalties, that's the royalties that they're earning off of that. And this is really not all that different from book publishing mm -hmm. um, or even music publishing. Uh, it's the same model. Numbers obviously would be different, but, but same basic ideas. And so, um, so then the publisher does, do, though, provide a number of things. And, and it makes sense for them to provide them because, again, they're really protecting their money, right? Like, if you're going to put $7 million into developing a game, having some studio develop a game, you want to make sure that it's getting the best marketing. And by best, I mean whatever, however much that is according to how much you're putting into the title, mm -hmm. right? So for a $7 million property uh, or project, Maybe it's three million bucks, I don't know. Maybe it's a lot more. Maybe you're making a really crappy game and you're just gonna market the hell out of it because that's how you think you're gonna make money. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, whatever. Whatever makes sense to the actual publisher themselves. Um, but then you might also pick up all of the sort of like hard to pay for incidentals because like there's a lot of end of project costs that again, the developer doesn't wanna pay for. Like you have to get a whole bunch of quality assurance people to test the hell out of your game and so, you know, 
like when we're working on Coder 2, for example, to go back to that, you know, we have 32 people in the studio. I think our QA was like 24 people at, at LucasArts. Mm -hmm. Plus we had localization QA, testing the, the localized versions of the game. And so, you know, you're essentially doubling team size and that's a big cost to add into the last six months of a project. Um, same thing, all your VO costs. You're gonna have to go and hire a bunch of voice actors and record all of this voice and you're gonna have to hire some composers and instrumentalists to play all of your music. And so the publisher will then come in and, and do, absorb all of those costs too. Um, oh, and then there's just straight up the cost to actually ship the product. Mm. So you've gotta pay somebody to make your boxes for you, you need to buy all the jewel cases, you need to buy all the um, CDs or DVDs or whatever you're putting it onto. Obviously this is all different with digital uh, mm. publishing now, but you know back in the day you would have to do all of that stuff. And so um, all of those costs the publisher takes and then they take the, the vast majority of the profit. Which isn't to say that if you don't if you make a good game, you can't, you know, make a lot of royalties. You can. Um, oh, you little jerk. That's what I get for not being careful. Um, the. Um, so there was, there's obviously some, there's, some big positives, and then there's some other like um, concessions and compromises you have to make. Yep. And when you're yep. in an agreement like that. Yeah, because ultimately it winds up being their money, so. Um, they will have clauses in the contract that, that determine that they have the ultimate say over like mm -hmm. content quality and stuff like that. <clears throat> so that they can ensure that, you know, you just don't make a, a million dollar game with their $7 million and then go hang out in Aruba for the rest of the time. Okay. That's good. That, that's, and yeah. that must have happened to somebody before and they're like, that's why we're doing it this way now. Well, you know, well, sometimes Projects go poorly, and you just spend a bunch of money on something, and and you know halfway through, I think somebody has to make a decision to like you know uh, cut bait, right? Mm. And so that happens too. So yeah, I, all kinds of things happen in game development. So with the going the Kickstarter route and seeing the success of Pillars, how did all of that affect the decisions uh, for upcoming projects? Did it uh, allow you to look for new opportunities that? you didn't feel were attainable before? That's a good question. I don't, I think Pillars of Eternity granted us a certain level of autonomy that we didn't have as much of before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a good feeling. But at the same time, it definitely felt like there was an upper limit to how much money we were gonna be able to raise off of a Kickstarter. So making a game like Pillars of Eternity uh, makes a lot of, oh, there's a lot of plants out here. Um, allows you to make a certain kind of game. But it doesn't allow you to make, you know, The Outer Worlds, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, certainly, but, dude, settle down, plants. The plants um, are. They're um, annoying. Yes. Um, So if you want to make something in the triple A space or even the double A space, you sort of have to find somebody who wants to give you some money to do it. And, um, dog. Yeah, that was my fault for being stupid, I get it. <laughs> I totally tried to tried to cheap that guy real quick and it didn't work at all. Uh, so when it came to something, again, like the Outer Worlds, um, you know, we were working on Pillars of Eternity 2. We knew we weren't going to be working on Armored Warfare anymore. We knew we wanted to do something, hopefully, in a, a new IP space. Mm. And uh, we hadn't done anything sci-fi in a really long time. And so uh, that, is, that, is where we, um, that is where we went. That is where we gravitated and said, like, no, you know what we, we're going to do is we're going to um, pitch a product that... Uh, that does cost a lot of money, but we're also going to pitch it from the pr from the position of almost like we don't need this game. Like we would really love to make this game with you, but we are not starving. Like mm -hmm. we are not um, without a home. We are not in a position where if we don't sign with you, our company closes. So if you want to make this game with us, great. Um, but being able to negotiate from that perspective is very, very different than, than being sort of the starving developer who's kind of living hand to mouth. 
And um, not that we were rich, by the way, that was not the case at all. Um, it was just, we were able to basically negotiate from a position of clout. Mm. And so- You have um, some credit, you credit, credibility to your name, the work you've done. Yeah, absolutely. And also like confidence in what you do. You're like, it's not like when you were early on pitching all these different games and trying yes. to find projects to keep the, the lights on. Exactly. And so, um, and so that went really well, and that's how we pitched uh, the Outer Worlds, mm. and and of course that that game um, wound up wound up getting done and doing really 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 well for us, and so um, you know that just sort of uh, led us to to how we wanted to move on with other things. When it comes to um, you know when it comes to grounded, I think that's that's Adam Bernanke's project, and he knows way more about it than I do, but. Again, I think it was just about like, hey, what can we do without, you know, sort of being uh, completely controlled by some other group and, mm -hmm. and do it with a small group and do it on our time scale and, but do it for a reasonable amount of money and, and make something really neat. Uh, so that is going to do it for us today, everybody. Thanks for hanging out and joining me. Chris, thank you so much for coming and talking the company's history and all your stories and knowledge and information about it. I think it was really informative. I had a lot of fun with it. I had a lot um, of fun with it. We'll definitely hope to have you back on in the future. Sounds good. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day and we'll see you later. Goodbye. Thanks everybody.